This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, so we move back again to the next uh, session, which was originally to have had um, two speakers on the question of orientation in space and identity. And since unfortunately one of those hasn't been able to make it, um, we've moved, Tom has very kindly agreed, Tom Smith, to come back to, um, to move from the later session into this one. So as in the previous um, session, I think we take the two papers together and then have questions afterwards. So we move into um, the first paper, which will be by Kali Gian Lahi, who is, um, has been a student of comparative literature in Paris 3, for the last five years, and um, is now looking to begin a PhD um, on one of two possible subjects, is what I understand. Yes. Either space in the nouveau roman, or indeed, possibly, he's also interested in concepts of nostalgia and revolt in the works of Moroccan writers. So his topic today is Orientation spatiale et espace d'orientation identitaire dans rue des boutiques obscures de, de Mondiale. So, Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to start by saying uh, that I have prepared this PowerPoint presentation in, in French, so I hope that it's fine with everybody. But I will try to make like bilingual presentation. Uh, so I hope this is fine with everyone. But obviously we can answer that and then questions in, in, in French or English. So to start with, um, I don't know if you know obviously Patrick Modiano recently, so French uh, novelist and writer who has just won this year, well obviously last year, the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, so Modiano was born in 1945 in Paris uh, this is just some, a few points from his biography, uh, and I will explain afterwards why, why it's interesting to grasp some elements here. Uh, so he, uh, her mother, his mother was a, a you say Flemish, Flemish, Flemish com comedian, uh, and his uh, father was a Jew from uh, Jewish from Alexandria in Egypt, and he lived as well in, in Greece. Uh, so Patrick Modiano is nearly 30 novels and narratives between 1968 and 2014. And most of uh, his uh, uh, the subjects he's looking at in his works are about Paris as a city uh, under the occupation, the period of occupation, uh, the German occupation, the quest for identity, uh, the history, his personal history, obviously, uh, the destiny of the Jewish community uh, with uh, a particular and specific uh, angle and aspect of approach. And we find as well in his works uh, lot, lot, uh, too, too many things about uh, memory, family, and especially uh, the figure of the father. So he won, before, before getting the Nobel Prize in 2014, he uh, was awarded by the Prix Goncourt, uh, which is one of the famous, maybe the famous uh, literary prize in, in, uh, in, in, in France, and the Grand Prix de l'Académie Française. Uh, I was looking, before, before getting to, to his work, to the work I will be uh, studying and talking about, which is uh, Rue des Boutiques Obscures, uh, he won the Prix Goncourt with this novel in, in um, I, I will show you the, 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 I think 1978. Uh, I, I had a look to his works, uh, taking into consideration the question of space, because this is the topic I will be talking about. Uh, and my idea here is to say that the space orientates his work, l'espace oriente l'oeuvre. So I have been looking to the titles of, his, of some of his novels, that's very interesting, uh, between 1968 and 2014. And as you can see here, we have got La Place de l'Étoile, Les Boulevards de Ceinture, Villa Triste, 
quartier perdu, vestiaire de l'enfance, voyage de noces, fleur de ruine, dans le café de la jeunesse perdue, l'horizon, et pour que tu ne te ne perdes pas dans le quartier, which is his last novel. Uh, what I underlined here uh, are all the elements uh, leading to the question of space, and this, that's very interesting because we find we can, from the titles of his works, figure out that space is orientating his literary production. So we find obviously Paris through La Place de l'Étoile, which is where Arc de Triomphe is. Uh, we found two, two, kind, two types and two categories of spaces, the public space and the private space. Donc pour l'espace public, ou ce que j'appelle l'espace citadin, uh, in a city, we have La Place, Boulevard, Quartier, Café, which are all referring to uh, spaces, uh, to public spaces within the city. And then we have got uh, uh, private spaces, uh, more in the intimacy, like, let's say, villa and vestiaire. Uh, what's interesting here, if we put together those spaces, those public spaces and private spaces, we can draw like what I call in topology urbaine, uh, which is a link to the space of the city where the characters are going to move in his novels. And usually, as I have mentioned here, so this movement, that's what I call deambulation, it's like wandering through the city, uh, with always a question of, of research either research of the identity, of a lost identity, uh, or a research of landmarks, kind of rediscovering the self through the city, through the space of the city. Uh, it's very interesting because uh, this map I show, I'm showing here is obviously Paris, and this is uh, taken from an article uh, which was published in Le Figaro, uh, in in, in Numeros, sorry, not, there's another one the same in, in Le Figaro. And this is someone who, uh, I think the, the journalist here, uh, has tr tried to uh, identify the spaces, all the spaces mentioned in the novels of Patrick Modiano within Paris. So uh, that, that's quite interesting exercise and I think we can go further than that and draw lines between all those spaces and try to understand what they refer to if we focus on each space, each geographical space within Paris, what does it mean for the character, for the writer, because usually there is a personal history involved as well. Uh, so I, 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 found, I found this, work, this, this uh, um, map quite interesting. And as I have mentioned here, there is a question uh, of uh, obsession. Well, because uh, uh, Patrick Modiano has always talked about Paris as an idea which uh, inhabits him. And he's always thinking about Paris, not only as a city, not only as a space where he lives, but more as an idea in his mind. And we're going to check this further. Uh, if I go to the uh, novel which I'm interested in, as I have said, uh, published in the 4th of September 1978, the sixth novel of Modiano, uh, just to draw a, 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 a vision on uh, the story. So the story, as you, as you see here, so Guy Roland, who is the main character, uh, uh, is a personage amnesique, so he has lost his memory. And he's working for uh, an agency of uh, police, actually, private one. And he's leaving his job. He decides to leave his job and to go to look for his identity because he doesn't remember anything from the past. And that, that, that is in, in Paris. So what, what the whole story is about uh, this search for his identity, for the, the, the reconstruction of the self through the space first in Paris and then somewhere else, as we, as we will see. And obviously we find here um, the topics uh, which I have mentioned. La recherche et la reconstruction de cette identité perdue, la quête spatiale, uh, the link with the memory, 
uh, and the question of, of uh, the Jewish uh, uh, destiny under the, the occupation. As, we, uh, as, I, as I can say here, is that I, I, we can identify in this work une poétique de l'orientation, this is what I call une poétique d'orientation, meaning that orientation is uh, orientation, uh, passion and orientation in the space and in the history, which bring the novel to exist and to develop the narrative. I first uh, started by looking at the title. <laughs> I'm kind of obsessed by, by the titles. Uh, and that's interesting because this title, Rue des Boutiques Obscures, is obviously a reference to une rue, no, streets, uh, and it doesn't mention actually our character, who is Guy Roland. Guy Roland is not, uh, is, doesn't appear in the title for some reason. So Mondiano has chosen to put forward a space even in the title of his novel, which is quite interesting. And when looking into the translation, into English, uh, so the book, the, the novel was translated as missing person, with here no reference to space. So I found it quite interesting to, I'm, I'm questioning myself why this translation doesn't pick up the elements of space. Is that a question I'm, I'm asking? Uh, and then I will move, now I will move to, to speak about the different types and roles and f functions, let's say, that uh, played by space in this novel. So we have got first what I call the lieu narratif, is um, the space where the, 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 the novel all is, is built and the, the, the events happen. And it's very interesting because if we look to the construction, actually, of the novel, it starts in a space, and it's fin it starts with the space, which is in the title, Rue des Rue de Boutiques Obscures. And in the end of it, at the end of it, it's mentioned again, Rue des Boutiques Obscures. The reason here is that Rue des Boutiques Obscures is the last space where this character is going to go to look for his identity. So I consider the, 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 the space as l'élément fondateur de la boucle narrative, which is like the loop, the narrative loop, starting from the space, which is Rue des Boutiques Obscures, and finishing with Rue des Boutiques Obscures. Uh, there is another thing we can say about this title, is that obviously we have got this uh, epithet, adjective, obscure, which is about darkness, which is about something uh, we don't understand, we need to clarify, and this has to do with the loss of memory from the main character. And also those boutique shops uh, in the title, so Rue des Boutiques Obscures, these, those shops can be linked to the, all those spaces of the memory that the character needs to fill in. Uh, finally, Une Rue des Boutiques Obscures is a street uh, where we are going to move from space to another, looking for the self and looking for the memory, for the lost memory. In a second, uh, uh, if, if we talk about uh, analyzing the title, when, when we search about this title, why Rue des Boutiques Obscures, we find that it is uh, a street in Rome, in Italy, and his name and doit son nom aux anciennes activités commerciales et artisanales sans fenêtre. So in the medieval age, there were shops in this street with no windows, so closed shops. And that's why we call it obscure, dark shops. Uh, this street is very interesting in Rome because we, uh, it, 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 it is famous because we found there a museum, Musée de la Crypta Balbi, where we found uh, the ruins of, of a theater, Théâtre de Balbus. We found as well in the same street a palace called Palais Caetani, I don't know if I'm misspelling it, 16th century, which was the place where um, some writers, famous writers like Chateaubriand, Stendhal, Renan, went and spent some time there. Uh, we found there uh, a, 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 um, une église, Santo Stanislao, 
And the same street, in the same street, we find a location of a literary Italian magazine called Botteghe Oscuri, which is a boutique obscure. And in the same street as well, we found that the, 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 the Communist Italian Party has his main building there. So when, 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 when putting all these elements together, we can reach to all this symbolic uh, of the space. Finally, ch checking this, um, choosing by choosing Rue des Boutiques Obscures, the writer brings together too many references. Literary references, historical references, obviously, social, cultural, linguistic as well. So the space of La Rue des Boutiques Obscures, which is in the title, uh, kind of uh, highlights the importance of space, which is going to be uh, proved afterward in the novel. So when, when reading, uh, actually, uh, when reading the, the novel, we find a lot of different uh, type of space which are represented in, in this novel. I have tried to list them here. So we, found, we can find um, streets, urban spaces, spaces of life, spaces of death, like les bars, les restaurants, les cimetières. We have also some spaces where we, we don't stay, it's just temporary spaces, like hotels. We have as well artistic spaces, obviously, with museums, castles, and monuments. We can say, to summarize, I don't want to give, maybe I don't have the time to give all the names of the streets and all the monuments, etc. But we can see the novel uh, as une fête de l'espace. It's like, I don't know how to say it in English, it's like a, uh, a pa party? Celebration. Celebration. Exactly. Celebration. Celebration of space. When looking into um, the functions uh, of the space in, in, in the novel, uh, we, can, we, we can say initially that the space obviously, his, main, his first fiction, uh, function sorry, is about giving, providing the frame where the, the Guillermo, the main character, is going to perform his uh, research and his quest for identity. But after that, we figure out that finally this image of urban topology is the, uh, the, le, le fil conducteur du récit, which brings uh, the coherence to the writing and which brings the coherence to the narrative itself. And it's, it's quite interesting because we find even some chapters who, who are written in the form of the space identity with an address, and that's it. Because the work of Modiano is looking as well to kind of discover some hidden spaces within the city of Paris. And some other chapters are written in the form of uh, identity information uh, f f of some characters and with the history of their uh, addresses where they, 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 they lived. Uh, what's interesting as well is to see how Modiano uh, makes from the space, the idea of space, a metaphorical representation of this quest of identity through those spaces, lost spaces in memory, and blank spaces. So um, he's filling those gaps from the beginning, starting and looking at first space to the second, and Giorno is making a lot of uh, contacts with different characters, and each time he is questioning himself about who, I, who am I, qui suis-je? And the novel, which starts in Paris and ends in Switzerland, actually, because the character, as uh, a Jewish under the German occupation, he went from there to uh, Switzerland uh, to escape, uh, of course, the situation in Paris, which, is, which was a bit oppressive. So uh, it's quite interesting to find how the character 
goes from inside Paris, Paris and Hamuros, <coughs> to a, a space which is abroad, which is uh, outside uh, uh, Paris and outside France. I think we can, we can also talk about uh, an espace identitaire, which is a space linked to identity, because, for example, there is a parallel, an evident parallel, between the quest for identity and the quest of space. And putting together this search of, for the space and search for identity, this is exactly what brings Modiano to uh, depict the reconstruction of the self, because this is what Giroulon is, is doing. He is reconstructing his identity. And there is also something quite interesting to look at when, uh, and, and this is one of the features of Patrick Modiano as well, he is choosing uh, the names of his character very, I mean, it's, it's, it's always very, very interesting to look at, the, at those names. I'm just going, I'm going to give one example. There is a character called Giorgia Zé, Giorgia Zé, who is the l'ancien consul, like ambassador, of Georgia in Paris. So if we put the, the name Geo, sorry, <laughs> Georgia Zé with Georgia, Again, we have another clue here about this uh, proximity between the character and the space. And another example as well is, is, is the, the way how space starts with characters. So char uh, characters always start with uh, space and they end, they end with space. I can give some, some examples here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this later. And another type of space, if, if we look at, is what I call l'espace apocalyptique. This is a kind, uh, an idea to say, to say how space can turn to be, I don't know if we say apocalyptic, yeah. yet, uh, which uh, the, the space some, some, sometimes find uh, uh, is represented as a symbol of the lost identity. I'm going to read just uh, uh, to, to quote Modiano. Tout était dé désert et figé autour de nous, même la tour Eiffel que j'apercevais là-bas, de l'autre côté de la Seine, la tour Eiffel, si rassurante d'habitude, ressemblait à une masse de ferraille calcinée. Another example, when the character Guy Roland went into uh, a cafe and there is a kind of uh, a panel sign at the entrance of the space saying on parle flamand. And that's it. Space here for Guy Roland, each time he moves from a space to another, uh, space for him becomes a factor of exclusion. He feels like all the spaces he's visiting are throwing him away to nothing, obviously. And his quest is always starting from the same point. So this is what I call the space of disorientation, the space de désorientation, like a symbol of the lost identity. And obviously, this is what constitutes the dramatic tension of the work. And also, if we talk about metaphorical space, uh, we can see the space as a metaphorical representation of the complexity of the identity. Because identity is not an easy, obviously, an easy concept. And Modiano uses space to explain that. And again, I can have, uh, I can give a few, uh, few examples here about this metaphorical uh, uh, thing. For example, at, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, at, at some stage of his, of his uh, research, Guy Roland has to visit a castle, which is the Chateau de Valreuse. And it's very interesting to read Modiano here, because we find again some parallels between the description of, uh, of the castle 
and uh, the meaning, the metaphor of the meaning. À mon grand étonnement, l'arrière du château ne correspondait pas du tout à la façade. Il était construit de pierres grises, le toit non plus n'était pas le même. De ce côté-ci, il se compliquait de pans coupés et de pignons, si bien que cette demeure qui offrait à première vue l'aspect d'un château Louis XIII ressemblait de dos à ces maisons balnéaires de la fin du XIXe siècle, dont il subsiste encore quelques rares spécimens. I'm going to move Um, another example, a quick one, uh, the, the, the search, the quest for, of uh, Girolon ends in an island in Bora Bora, where he is supposed to meet someone who's going to give him the final clue about who, he, who is he, really. And again, it's very interesting to see how the space of the island is, is by, the, by its definition, déconnecté de la terre and entouré d'eau which can be a parallel with this deconnection with, with, with the past. And it's also uh, an espace fragmenté, which can be compared with, obviously, the broken identity of the character. And we should also mention that the island, each island is supposed to be uh, uh, covered by water. So this leads us to l'effacement de l'identité, which may disappear. And the, the, the other thing we can say is that the space is also used as, as a, a factor and element of reconstruction uh, by reconnecting the personal memory with the space. And this is the job, the, the work he's doing, Guillermo, all over uh, the, the book. Uh, and this is here where I can say that the space in this novel is the lieu de déploiement des stratégies d'orientation et de reconstruction identitaire. It's really the place where all the rebuilding of the self takes place. And obviously in the novel, you will find some modified spaces, some uh, spaces who, who, are, who, who dis disappeared, which can be linked to the human condition. And because humans are not lasting forever, and we will all disappear at some point, and this is very interesting to see how those modified and disappeared spaces can be linked to humanity. And finally, I will end by linking, talking about uh, the, 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 le temps, the factor du temps, and saying in, in this novel we will find a tension, a permanent tension between two temporalities. La première temporalité et le temps présent de la quête identitaire, meaning this is the time where uh, the character is looking for himself, looking for his identity, and this past, the, so always between the present and the past. And the, the whole project of Guy Roland and of Modiano, of course, behind it, is to bring together the present and the past, to rebuild this uh, continuity of spaces and to rebuild this lost identity. En conclusion, je dirais que dans ce roman, euh, il y a une poétique d'orientation bidimensionnelle, à la fois spatiale et identitaire, comme je l'ai expliqué. Il y a aussi un espace pluridimensionnel, puisqu'on trouve aussi bien un espace géographique, un espace métaphorique, symbolique et fonctionnel. Et c'est intéressant de, de voir qu'il y a deux, deux types d'espaces, deux stratégies spatiales, un espace de désorientation, pour exprimer le chaos de l'identité et de la mémoire perdue, avec versus un espace d'orientation pour reconstruire cette identité. Et c'est ainsi qu'on part de l'orientation, qu'on fait de l'orientation spatio-identitaire un facteur d'éclairage et d'explication de la condition humaine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that paper. As I said before, we, we, we defer questions until uh, we've heard the second paper. So we'll move straight away to, to Thomas Murray, who has, as I said, a kind of idea to bring his paper forward, even though it was um, originally in, in, in the panel about uh, orientation beyond the hexagon. So Thomas Murray um, has a BA in French and Russian and an MA in French um, from the University of Sheffield. Um, his MA was on narrative voice and trauma um, in Tierno Monimbo. And he's currently a lecturer at the Université de Valenciennes and um, hoping to begin, as I said earlier, a PhD shortly. 
And his title today is Removing from Space to Time, uh, with a priority. Disorientating History, Making Strange in Tierno Money Nimble's The Tahoe Thank you. Um, this, um, I'm going to start this presentation um, first with a short discussion and introduction to, uh, to Monin Envoy, certainly some comments and things about it before introducing uh, this idea of making strange, um, which also referred to as defamiliarization. It's, it's a concept developed by um, Russian formalist and um, uh, theoretician uh, uh, Victor Schwarzky. Um, and it's something that I think um, has a certain valency to the theme of today's uh, conference. So um, even though it may not be the most obvious choice of theory to apply to a post-colonialist, uh, to, um, to, a, to a West African contemporary writer, but here you go, let's be kind. Um, so, um, so to start off with, um, in a wide-ranging interview uh, given in the summer of 2010, uh, Paris-based Guinean exile and author Tiana Monanembo stated the following regarding the distinction between the role of the writer of historic fiction versus that of the historian. Du point de vue de l'historien comme du point de vue du politique, l'histoire est un fait global. C'est la grande masse. C'est le, le grand événement. Voilà. Alors que chez l'écrivain, l'histoire est réduite comme disait Sangar, à une chose à l'auteur d'homme. Et also, he, go, he continues. Le roman ajoute à l'histoire toute cette dimension humaine qui est très difficilement traduisible par l'objectivité historique, justement. From such quotes, it may appear reasonable to assume that for Mon and the role of the writer of historic fiction is to present history in such a way that the reader may easily experience the essential humanity of the events of the past. The historic novelist, apparently, is not to become concerned with empirical facts or the bigger picture, but to engage with the human aspect of a given story, reproducing historical events on a human scale in a manner that renders them easily comprehensible and therefore accessible to his reader. Now, as anyone who's tried to approach one member will know, alas, the simplification of epic events of history is far from being his project. Um, the narrative and historical complexity of his works, of historic fiction, um, dealing variously with the traumas of the transatlantic slave trade, European colonisation of Africa, and the Second World War, have led to Mon and his works being variously described as protean, impertinent, unstable, <laughs> opaque, enigmatic, and my personal favourite, um, <laughs> saying that, he, that his work presents a perversion of the literary genre. <laughs> um, previous studies. Um, so previous studies have, um, have established uh, this willful opacity of uh, Mon and Embo's work. Um, the purpose of this paper is to reevaluate this opacity through analysing the author's engagement with the memory and history of the Second World War in general, and the French resistance in particular, in his 2012 novel, Le Terroriste Noir. I will then demonstra to demonstrate that Monin Embo's apparent opacity in fact constitutes a deliberate effort to disorientate his audience, rendering the familiar and accepted narratives of history unfamiliar, and in so doing enabling his audience to experience the human dimension of this heroic element of the French national narrative. Key to my analysis will be is, is Victor Shlovsky's notion of making strange, to which I will now turn my attention before returning to the terrorist noir. In his 1917 essay, Artist Technique, um, Russian literary critic and theor theoretician Victor Shlovsky outlines his notion of postronienian translated variously into English as making strange or perhaps more similar to those, to those researching in the arts as defamiliarization. Um, Shlosky observes that the more we are exposed to an object, the less we actively perceive it. Our perception of the object becomes automatically. We perceive it only unconsciously. We become used to being presented with a given object or idea, but we do not recognize it on a cognitive level. In the words of Shlosky, we have become habit habitualized to perceiving the world in a certain way. And this habitualization removes the sensation from life. Um, he says, habitualization uh, devours works, clothes, furniture, one's wife, and the fear of war, interesting to our, uh, 
the, war, the figure of war and war is, is a thing that's interesting that he mentions that. Um, art exists that, that one, that one, on, uh, art exists so that one may recover the sensation of life. It exists to make one feel things, to make the stone stone. The purpose of art is to impart the sensation of things as they are perceived, not as they are known. The role of, gen of art in general and literature in particular, in Shklovsky's understanding, is to allow us to experience anew that which is already familiar to us. The artist removes objects from the automatism of perception, enabling his audience to, uh, sorry, uh, in enabling his audience to realise our existence. That which is poetic or artistic, rather than empirical and objective, takes the familiar object and makes it unfamiliar, disorientating the audience and giving them an opportunity to approach and see the subject matter in a new life. The artist makes strange that which is ordinary. Now, to, to, to illustrate this point, Shklovsky gives the example of Tolstoy's short story, Hostum, a text written from the point of view of, yes, that's it, a horse, which at one point is sold from one person to another. The horse is bemused by the transaction and wonders what, wor what, yeah. what words such as my horse or even mine might mean. The horse's naive, naive attempt to comprehend the abstract, although universally accepted, notion of private ownership serves to disorientate the reader, in so doing enabling him or her to apprehend the absurdity of the idea that one living thing may truly own another. The use of a naive narrator is not the only device used in making strange. It's just an example of one of many that Shkrovsky used. Um, rather, um, it is one of um, innumerable other devices that the author may use, uh, may, may make use of in order to wake his reader from a state of habituation and in so doing enable them to reconsider that which was previously unconsciously taken as known. Having established an, an understanding of Shlovsky's notion of making strange or defamiliarization, let us now turn our attention to establishing what we understand by the French national myth of the resistance. Um, in his 1990 monograph, Le Sangre de Vichy, Henri Rousseau, um, and coined the term a résistentialisme to critically describe the popular myth that people from France had, as a united whole, resisted the occupation by Nazi Germany from, from, the, from, the, uh, from the moment it began in the summer of 1940. Such an understanding, promoted by both nationalist, Gaullist factions as well as communist ones, would be actively and officially cultivated by successive governments in the decades following the war in order to promote cohesion and prevent, and prevent the splintering of a country still coming to terms with the division and trauma of the conflict, while at the same time attempting to reassert itself on the geopolitical stage. One of the most famous expressions of its sentiments is perhaps the speech given by André Malraux to mark the pantheonisation of the remains of resistance hero Jean Moulin, wherein Malraux extol extols the, un the unité de la, de, de la résistance and evokes the combat command and you, um, uh, the, combat, you, uh, uh, the combat command that the various factions engaged in. It is precisely this kind of universalizing and uniting national myth that Monanembo is referencing when he talks about history as un fait global, la grande masse, le grand événement. And it is in contrast to this model of history that Monanembo sets out to present the events of the past as something of a more human scale. Published in 2012, Le Terre Noir presents a fictionalized account of the experiences of the real life historical figure, Adiba, a terrier Senegalais, that is to say, uh, a French, uh, an Af of the, a soldier of African origin fighting in the, in, in the French army who went on to found and lead the resist a resistance cell or Maki in the Vosges region of France during the Second World War. At the opening of the story, Bart is a veiling capture following the disastrous defeat of the French at the hands of the Wehrmacht in June 1940. The novel provides an account of his life in the small towns and villages of the Vosges, um, as well as his various uh, romantic adventures, um, his role in the resistance um, and his eventual uh, betrayal, capture and execution in the summer of 1943. The first and most persistent device that modern envoy uses to make the familiar stories of the heroics of the resistance unfamiliar is narrative voice, a particular favourite topic of mine. Um, the text that we encounter it is apparently the transcription of a monologue, with the reader occupying the position of someone who is being verbally addressed by the narrator. As the story progresses, we discover that the narrator is one Germaine Tergres, a now octogenarian inhabitant of the Gorge region, who knew Adibar during the war. 
while the person she is addressing and whose, read, and whose place the reader occupies is Barr's nephew, who has come to France from Guinea in order to collect the medal in recognition of his uncle's actions as a member of the French resistance and to attend various ceremonies in the region commemorating his uncle's life and death. So, you're reading it, and what we're, uh, when you're reading it, you're in the position of Barr's nephew, and you're hearing an account of Barr's life via this 80-year-old lady who, is, who lived through the war. Okay? Um, Germain, the narrator, is of the author's own invention, and serves primarily as a repository of the community's collective memory of Barr and his maquis. The nephew, however, is not invented. Um, Barr, Barr's nephew did come to France from Guinea in order to collect his uncle's post posthumously, uh, posthumously awarded service medal in 2003. The fictional nature of the characters is not, however, our focus here. Rather, what is of interest to us is the way in which this complex diegetic setup is used to render the familiar story of the resistance unfamiliar to the reader. In the novel's opening passage, Germain states the following. C'était la grande guerre, monsieur. La chalabar, comme l'appelait Mamiche Léontine, qui en 60 ans, ici, qui en 60 ans chez le Laurent n'avait eu rien concédé de son accent de son gars. Vous ne pouvez pas l'ignorer. Personne ne peut ignorer cette période. Même chez vous, c'est le bord du Limpopo. Here, Germain appears to, to be somewhat accusing Bar's nephew of having an inferior knowledge of the war, of not having grown up with its memory. Furthermore, while she clearly has enormous respect bordering on reverence for Bar, her reference to the Limpopo River, which is located in South Africa, a whole continent away from Guinea, Bar's country of origin, betrays a condescending ignorance towards his nephew. <laughs> The effect of such passages and asides, which we frequently encounter throughout the novel, <clears throat> is to disorientate us as readers. We occupy, uh, as stated before, we occupy the position of Barr's nephew, who is assumed to be largely ignorant by, uh, by the narrator. The story is therefore presented to us in a way that assumes our ignorance regarding the events of the war, disorientating the reader, encouraging him to look at the war anew. Thus, by dint of the relationship that an Embo creates between reader and, reader, narrator, and narrative in the opening passage and maintains throughout the text, the author succeeds in rendering the near universally known story, um, certainly in the West, um, of the French resistance strange. Um, the author also makes use of this narrative situation to, de to temporally disorientate the reader. Um, Germain's uh, narrati uh, narration, 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 as mentioned above, um, contains frequent asides wherein she addresses her audience in the novel's present day, that is to say, the moment when she's addressing Barr's nephew, um, before returning to the main narrative, which takes place in the 1940s. Um, however, even this main narrative is not clearly linear, linear in structure. Um, rather, it is presented in episodes, as and when the octogenarian, Germaine, um, remembers, remembers them. The result is a non non-linear... Non is a non-linear narrative, never call, which has very little in the way of time markers to help us as readers to orient, orientate ourselves within the story. For example, at one point, Germaine recounts the day Barr moved in with her family before trailing off to ponder where he may have lived or um, how he may have survived when he first, when he first arrived in her village, um, something that she already covered in the first few pages of the novel. Um, um, with such temporal touring and froing, the author invites speculation as to the reliability of, of Germain's account of, uh, of hers and Barr's experience of the war. Such potential fallibility is detected by the reader, making him, him or her aware, aware of, this, of the story as being told is not necessarily known in an empirical sense, but rather um, is experienced through the perception of both narrator, narratee, and finally us as readers. Um, uh, 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 sorry, um, Germaine's, Germaine's gender and age is also of interest in terms of making strange. Her age and the nature of her of her of her deep personal uh, and the nature of her deep um, personal affection for Bar, um, uh, and the nature of her deep personal affection for Bar, uh, she appears to at once have a teenage infatuation with him, while at the same time viewing him as a father figure, is also of interest in terms of making strange. She, foc she focuses not on an exact account of his exploits as a Makisar, per se, choosing instead to focus on his personal relationships, including her own attempts 
her own fairly hopeless attempts to flirt with him. Um, consequently, Germain's biased, sentimentalised and inconsistent account of, of history appears strange as it contrasts with the accepted conventions of engaging with historical facts. Germain's incapacity to extr extricate herself from the story then renders it strange in a Shklovskian sense. Such strangeness, according to Shklovsky, uh, according to Skrovsky's understanding, encourages the reader to appreciate the human aspect of the story in question. Thus, through his choice of narrator alone, Mononenko succeeds in reproducing the collective history of the resistance on a more human scale. Mononenko also finds fertile ground for making strange in the culture clash between Bar and the other characters, uh, particularly the members of his maquis. Uh, Bar's status as an outsider is key to this. Uh, although not in all, in, always in the manner that one might expect. Indeed, that's key to the entire sort of enjeu, the entire sort of notion of making strange. <coughs> um, the colour of his skin, either the name, very, very obviously distinguishes from the rest of the characters, who on occasion, somewhat condescendingly enough about his back, refer to him either as Monsieur Le Negre or just Le Negre in a period when Ghanaians and Sub-Saharan Africans in general were still very much considered a colonised people in Western Europe. Despite the obstacles posed by the racial adversity he faces, however, Bar becomes a figure of authority in the community that he becomes a part of. As Germain, as Germain puts it, Mes parents, le maire, le colonel, tous à genoux devant ce petit bout d'homme à la voix douce, uh, mais, mais qui n'avait même pas besoin de se lever le petit doigt pour se faire obéir. Obéir. Euh, Quelqu'un qui, euh, à un moment où sa race passée pour la plus vile du monde de l'humanité, a réussi à, à s'imposer sur tout un canton de France. Despite his situation as a sole black person in the community, he sets himself apart not by the colour of his skin, but by the strength of his leadership. Indeed, Mononembo contrasts Bar's culture, discipline, and general competence with the poor manners, quarrelsome nature, and superstitions of the other members of his maquis and of the community. We read, for example, that in one instance, Bar returns to the maquis camp to bear witness to, <coughs> uh, to bear, uh, sorry, to bear witness to the following bizarre scene, um, wherein he kind of crests the hill to look at what his uh, the maquis are, the members of his maquis are doing, to find them engaging in this strange sort of baptism ritual where they've rebuilt the church and are generally ignoring being resistance fighters and they're sort of playing this silly little game. Um, well, sorry, and engaging in this strange ritual. Um, Bar, the lone black character in the novel, is faced with the ta task of attempting to understand the strange rituals of the local populace, rituals that pose a threat to the security and success of the Maquis. Um, indeed, during his time in the Vosges, Bar must not only navigate the customs of the locals, but also avoid the bitter family, or perhaps it might be better to say clannish, um, feuds that divide both the community and the Maquisar. Um, he must also grapple with the local Vosgian dialect. Um, he is one of few people in the, um, in the novel, uh, the narrator included, who actually consistently speaks in standard French. Everyone else uses Vosgian isms that sometimes can throw you a bit off guard. Um, for example, everyone refers to each other as, um, there's a character called Etienne, and in Vosgian French they use the definite article all the time, so it becomes Letienne, and people become La Paneguette, and they've all got strange words, and they use strange words to refer to food and things. They've also got a special word for German speakers, which is Agnum. Um, which means people from either Alsace or Germany. Um, uh, and also, as we saw earlier on, this, this use of chalavar, these random sort of, um, which means a, a big mess or a, a complete and utter sort of uh, disaster in, um, in, in, Al in Alsatian. Um, Alsatian? Alsatian? Alsatian. Yeah, Alsatian. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so um, through including such detail, Mononembo succeeds in inverting the racial prejudices of the time and also portrays the, the language and culture of white metropolitan France as strange, alien, petty, and barbaric, and, and ultimately incompa incompatible with the noble virtues, with the noble values celebrated in the official version of the history of the resistance. Again, the unfamiliar the unfamiliarity of this quarrelsome representation obliges the audience to reconsider their approach to the familiar history of their existence. As many critics and journalists have previously pointed out, the Tarrant Noir undoubtedly represents a monument to Bar's memory, to the memory of, of, um, of uh, 
um, of uh, <coughs> colonial troops fighting fighting for the free French in general, um, and an attempt to compensate for um, uh, Metropolitan France's historic reticence in acknowledging the contribution of black and colonial troops to its liberation. However, the, um, um, however, the text also <coughs> serves to enable the reader to reassess their understanding of the actors of this part of this dark period of French history as a whole. By centering the story on the unfamiliar figure of Barr, uh, Monnenambo disorientates his audience. In Schlossian terms, Barr's presence, along with the erratic and unreliable narration, uh, unreliable relation of Germain, served to de de-automize the, the reader's engagement with the history of the Résistance. Subsequent, subsequently, he creates a characteristically opaque, courtier and irreverent, whatever, or better still, unfamiliar representation of an otherwise familiar story. To conclude then, it is useful to return to the comments made by Monanembo regarding the distinct roles of the historian and the novelist engaging with history. The presence of Germaine as an unreliable narrator and the text of Barnes as, as an unfamiliar, unfamiliar um, protagonist, the story and theatres as readers. As we have seen in the Tarek Snoir, Malin rejects the all encompassing epic historic linear narrative of the, resist of the resistance in favour of an approach, excuse me, in favour of an approach that emphasizes the essentially human element of the actors in this movement. The familiar history of the resistance is made strange, and as a consequence, our perception of it becomes deautomatized. De de uh, isn't automatic. Um, the, end result, <laughs> the end result is that Mononembo succeeds in creating a distinctly poetic and literary interpretation of the resistance that enables his audience to experience anew the human element of this complex human story.